Okay, so, well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak. So, um, okay, so one of the questions that many of us are interested in is how information is represented and processed by the circuitry of the nervous system and how this is disturbed in disease states. Um, so, the circuits we're talking about, the circuitry we're talking about um, are things, so mouse, oh, I think I've got to use this one, sorry, of course. Here we are. Uh, our, our circuit's more like you know, that on the left than that on the right, of course. Uh, um, but there are certain key things sort of in common with, with investigating these. And one of, one of this, if you want to understand how this circuit at the, on the right worked, um, you would really want to know about the activity in the individual um, elements of that circuit, the transistors, and you would actually sort of want to be sort of targeting um, individual transistors um, in some way to you know, represent the, the logic of the information contained there um, to understand how that worked. And um, we'd argue that the same thing is true over here, that in order to answer these, you know, this kind of question, we need to record from targeted individual processing elements. So what I'm going to be doing in the talk today is um, basically giving a sort of a, a technology talk here. There's a sort of a neuroscience talk I could give as well, but this will be focusing more on the technology. Um, on some of the tools that we're using to look at that, um, uh, look at targeted elements. One, one of, of which is um, uh, automated uh, patch clamp recording, um, the other of, uh, of which sort of comes back to sort of calcium imaging and sort of joined up with some of the tools, that, some of the informatics type tools that we're, we're u developing to, um, to work on this. Um, so the gold standard uh, for monitoring neuronal properties, of course, is the whole cell patch clamp. Um, Developed some time ago, some time ago now, um, uh, obviously used with uh, um, great uh, to great acclaim to study properties of individual uh, ion channels, etc. Um, and I, I'm sure everyone in the room sort of knows at least roughly how it works. Basically, so you take a pipette down, you know, stick it on to the side of a cell. Um, you can do whole cell record, you can do sort of cell attached type recording with it where you basically can monitor say action potentials without disrupting um, the cell or you can you know, break into the cell and go whole cell so you are in principle disrupting the cell but you've got full access to the inside of the cell, you can monitor sub-threshold signals, you can even put uh, plasmids and things in and, and modify what's going on in the cell. Now this was done initially in vitro and um, later on in vivo um, so has been a, a sort of very powerful technique. Um, so in, in, you know, moving into the 1990s, um, originally Vidya Sagar and Kreutzfeldt were the first uh, to do it uh, in vivo. Um, so, okay, that, so that's, that's great, but done in vivo, this method, basically you take a pipette down and you record from the first cell that you happen to come across before your pipette gets blocked. Um, so it's not really targeting. Um, coming back to targeting, um, so... There is, and this is actually a very old slide, there are, um, there are more tools available now, but we have this fantastic library of, of um, initially Cree-based and now um, a variety of other molecular tools, intersectional targeting, where we can actually um, have uh, transgenic mice um, expressing some reporter in a specifically targeted cell type. Um, so we've got examples here of dentate granule cells, cortical interneurons, Purkinje cells, Bergman glial cells, etc. Um, and in principle, we can also um, use dye-based approaches. This is the, the classical AM dye approach where we can actually sort of separately label um, um, well, neurons and glial cells here by combining uh, two different dyes. So by using these kind of approaches, we can actually target sort of individual circuit elements. Now, we can also, using two-photon imaging, we can, um, we can in vivo, image in vivo um, the elements of these circuits, so that's another tool in the toolbox here. These are um, uh, some images I collected in my lab some time ago now. Um, so let's put that together with, uh, with uh, patch clamping and sort of see where we go. So basically this was uh, uh, developed by Troy Magri um, originally in uh, early 2000s, um, two photon targeted patching. So basically you can fill a pipette with red dye, um, so we can see that sort of here. Um, a pipette with red dye. Um, this has been taken down into the brain under the guidance of a two-photon microscope um, uh, to target a cell which has been labelled with green fluorescent protein. 
Um, and so this is all, all happening uh, under a two-photon microscope. We've effectively got a craniotomy with um, uh, the objective sort of sitting above it here. Um, now, this is actually harder. harder. You might think intuitively it maybe it should be easier than blind in vivo patching because um, now you can see what you're doing. Okay, that is a plus. But the downside is, so with um, blind in vivo patching, you're basically, you'll accept the first cell you come across. You know, that, that's one, a legitimate target. With um, two photo and targeted patching, you're act you actually, um, you have a smaller number of targets. You want to target a particular um, type of cell, so that, that's your target. So there are a smaller number of these uh, potential targets. So it's actually, uh, uh, the hit rates are, are somewhat lower. Um, and as a result, there's extremely few um, experienced two photo and targeted patches worldwide, and um, they have a bad habit of getting promoted and not having enough time to spend at the lab anymore. Um, so <laughs> this has limited the... Um, uh, limited the dissemination of the technique. So one of the things we set out to do was um, to use robotic automation to sort of increase the productivity here um, and lower the entry barrier. Um, so in this, we were motivated by a paper from Ed Boyden's group um, uh, by Suhaza Kondar Ramaya, who had automated um, blind uh, in vivo patching. So we looked at this and said, well, maybe we can sort of add a two-photo and targeting layer to that. Um, our initial thoughts were sort of quite naive on this. We thought, okay, we could just select a target and move down in the brain. It turns out there's a, a crucial technical, technical problem we'll talk about in a minute. You have to solve with that. But basically, it seemed that maybe automation, uh, um, you know, robotic uh, technology, um, is at least a way to sort of overcome some of this dissemination barrier. Okay, so we need robots. Um, not robots like this guy. He would be a terrible patcher. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, okay, so the first thing we set out to do was basically to re reproduce... Um, um, the Ed Boyden paper. So I, um, it's always good to give summer students an impossible project just to see how well they can do. So I gave this to, to Luca and Aquino as a, as a summer project, as an intern in my lab. Um, and he didn't, he didn't quite manage to succeed in it. We actually got a fair way, a fair way th um, through in doing it. This is a sort of our version of the, uh, of the, um, the blind in vivo patcher. Um, and basically you take, a, you, know, a, you, know, you start with the pad on the surface of the brain, um, and then sort of hand over to automatic control. You're monitoring the impedance, um, controlling the pressure. Um, we've built a, a nice little sort of automatic um, pressure controller which can do sort of graded pressure um, controls with sort of fast time scales. You can sort of uh, uh, try and imitate the kind of behavior that a human uh, patcher would do. And then we, you get this sort of readout uh, display over here. Um, there are different modes of sort of the pipette insertion mode. We've got a higher pressure when you're going down. So you go into cell hunting mode. Um, and um, sort of monitoring impedance when you get sort of close to a cell, you know, try and seal, etc. Um, and um, so this all this all works nicely. So basically, the, our success rates with this. So if you want to just do cell attached recordings, it's actually got a 74% success rate. Um, so it's quite a high hit rate there. Um, going whole cell that reduces, so you lose a few when you go to whole cell. So it goes down to 51%. So it's basically similar to the um, the Kudanda Ramaya. Um, uh, uh, earlier um, work. Okay, now the problem is for, for using this for doing um, targeted recording, the chances of hitting a cell of a defined type are quite low unless it happens to be a layer 2, 3 pyramidal cell, in which case you know, your odds are reasonable. Um, so, so we need to put this two-photo and targeting layer over the top. Um, so this is our, our version of the two-photo and targeted patching robot. Um, now the key problem, um, I should just mention now, is that as you move a pipette down through the brain, you are moving the brain. So let's say you've you've got your labelled cell, you've sort of scanned around in 3D, in 3D, um, sort of clicked on it in your, your system. So okay, here, this is where it is. You move the pipette through the brain, it starts to move the tissue. You get sort of visto viscoelastic deformation of the tissue. Um, the target sort of starts to migrate, and so you need to compensate for that. So a lot of the problem here has been uh, has involved sort of dealing with that. Um, so the way the way this works, um, it's basically a sort of similar similar kind of setup, but we've now got um, um, basically the two photon uh, sort of layer over the top, fairly standard. Um, so you take the pipette down, um, you acquire the pipette tip, you either do that um, manually or through an automatic uh, method, um, and then it basically sort of goes down sort of as, as before, you've got a sort of automatic approach. Now you've, you've acquired the target, okay, so you've selected a particular target, um, and now as we go through, and I'll sort of show you a bit more about this in, in a minute, we're actually um, modifying the trajectory in order to keep the target um, in a, a defined position. 
Um, uh, okay, and then as we go through, th through that, um, we'll go to a sort of cell engagement, etc., seal formation, and so forth as before. Um, this is just a sort of actually an early picture of what the, of what the system uh, sort of looked like there. We've got this, it's all built in LabVIEW, um, this sort of LabVIEW control package that you that you use. Um, now the key thing, as I said, is is dealing with this uh, this movement issue. Um, the way we've dealt with this um, is basically um, we've built a little computer vision system. So you're, you're using the two photo microscope in effect as the eyes of the system. Um, uh, you you've got your target location and um, you can then select either the target or actually surrounding, surrounding structures as well, um, uh, which are then tracked. Um, so it's basically an optic, uh, sort of an optic flow type system where you're actually sort of tracking um, the motion of the targets. You do that in both X, Y and in Z. The Z is, is somewhat special. And in the Z direction, what you're doing is actually um, keeping the target in focus. So this is an autofocus algorithm, um, which sort of works as, so basically, you can, um, this some you know, basic image processing to first sort of find find the targets, um, and then um, you want to keep basically the selected struct selected structures um, in focus. So there's a sort of a contrast focus score um, which you can automatically assign, and then as the tissue moves, basically your targeted structure starts to become you know, just to go out of focus, even under two photon, and you can actually use that to keep uh, to keep target tracked. So we do this iteratively, you're moving the pipette down, you're tracking, um, so you, you're, you've got the two photon layer basically taking stacks around the target location while you're moving the pipette down and you're iteratively adjusting the uh, trajectory of the pipette as you go down. So here's an example here, um, you can see that um, it's sort of moving down. So these numbers here correspond to the points on this trace here, so this is in the, in the automatic approach period. You can see there's a few sort of wiggles as there's been a bit of tissue movement. Um, there's a, a more major jump over there. Obviously something sort of shifted. Oops. Um, and then after that it's sort of going down relatively directly towards the cell. And then you, know, then you go on into the sort of sealing process and breaking. The very last bit is effectively operating similar to the, the blind, uh, uh, blind auto patcher. Um, alternatively, you can hand it over to human control if, if you wish if you want to do something fancy at that point. Um, so this works quite nicely. Here's a, just a few examples. Here's a sort of GAD67 positive uh, interneuron. Um, we've done some recordings from. Just to, um, another example. So this is actually, it works, it works with um, AM diluting as well. <coughs> the old method before we got GCAP6. You know. um, um, and uh, we've used that uh, to do uh, recordings from um, sort of various, various cells as well. Um, you know, just sort of systematically, you can do it um, for sort of different different cell types. It works on astrocytes as well. Here's an example. Um, so before I was showing you filling the pipette with uh, with a red dye, Alexa five nine four, and targeting a, a GFP labeled structure. In this case, we filled um, um, the pipette with Alexa four eighty eight um, and targeted sulfur rhodamine labeled um, astrocytes. Um, it's quite useful for doing cell attached recordings as well. As I said, the hit rate's actually um, higher for cell attached, um, so you can you can use it to do um, cell attached recordings. Um, and okay, so so then we're at the point. Okay, it works. We want to know how well it works. So how well does it work in comparison to a human human operator? Um, and we weren't really at this stage trying to make it better than a human operator, just as good as. And I think we managed to achieve that. So here's. Basically, here's a number of um, dimensions on which you might consider sort of the performance. One is the input resistance of the recording, um, the amplitude of the spike. Okay, basically, if you've got a bad recording, that's a, always a sort of a good, uh, good signature. Um, the resting membrane potential, um, uh, also very relevant, um, and of course the holding, the holding the amount of time that you can actually hold the cell for. So the the green. Um, um, triangles here are the robotic system uh, with um, neocortical uh, pervalvulmin containing interneurons. We've got a few examples of um, of Purkinje cells as well in the same the same transgenic mouse model labeled Purkinje cells as well. So in the cerebellum, so we used a few of those as well just as a sort of a, a cross check. And 
Uh, and then sort of a, a comparison with a manual operator. So when we sent this paper off uh, for publication, um, the reviewers sort of came back saying, this is all very nice, but uh, can you compare the performance with an experienced hum human two-photo untargeted patcher? Um, so uh, we didn't have one on hand, but we managed to train up an in experienced in vivo patcher, and, and that was sort of acceptable. So this was someone we trained up to... Uh, uh, to do the two photo untargeted recordings, having had a lot of experience doing in vivo blind recordings. Um, and essentially, um, you know, very similar performance uh, across the board with about the same number of uh, recordings made. Um, so, basically, this the table here sort of shows a comparison performance. This is, um, this is the robot, this is doing it manually, this is our, our experienced human. Um, this is not doing it two photo and targeted but just doing a blind just using the using the robotic system but just to do a blind recording. So seventy four percent goes down to um, forty six percent getting a seal um, there for the robot or fifty six uh, for doing it manually. Um, when you go down to um, sort of actually going whole cell, it's more like about twenty percent success rate. So about uh, one in five of these penetrations you'll actually get a, a whole cell recording um, with the robot. Um, it would be 51% if you just wanted to uh, do it blind. Yep. Is, this, is this the total that made it to the cell or the total number of runs at all? This is the total... Um, so, so, this, no, th so this one here is the total that have managed to get a successful seal. Okay. Um, so um, that, that's of all of the yeah, sorry, penetrations. What, yeah. What's the denominator? Um, the denominator is the number of times that you've put a, um, a pip out into the brain. Yeah. Um, and, you know, therefore we're getting overall, you know, above about one uh, a whole cell recording per animal, which is sort of uh, where it needs to be to be useful. Um, with basically very similar quality of recordings. So that's, so basically the conclusion there is we now have a system which is effectively um, sort of very similar to a, to a human. Um, now as we started doing this, um, we became aware reasonably soon that uh, Ed Boyden's group were also working on this, um, um, and we basically made a, uh, you know, we, we sort of exchanged notes at some point and then and then sort of went sort of separate ways and and then um, reconverged to actually have our papers uh, accepted in the same issue of Neuron. Um, just a sort of a brief comment on the differences in the in the method. Um, they actually ended up being very similar. Um, the main difference is that we our our approach we basically. Um, uh, we make as many movement corrections as possible further away from the cell. The idea that being that if you're moving your pipette, potentially slicing through a tissue close to the cell, we're damaging the circuitry we're interested in. Um, they instead, uh, and, and then we went sort of obliquely down to, to the cell. They instead went to above the cell and then moved down um, on it from above. Um, the plus of our method is, yeah, less maybe damage to the local circuitry. The downside of our method is I think we're slightly more likely to sort of do what we call an impale, impalement, where basically your pipette starts to sort of push through the cell a little bit as well. And that may be something that can be optimised uh, uh, further. Like some of the nice recordings we got that otherwise look nice. If you look at the, if you look at the, the stack, you can see that the pipette has sort of pushed a little bit too far. Um, so it um, works quite nicely. Um, uh, hopefully we'll um, improve rollout of, of this uh, technique. Um, we've basically got all the material... Um, um, openly available and we're going to be trying to sort of uh, open up, up further to, to build systems for people. Um, and our next steps on that, we, we're using that in com combination with calcium imaging to examine mice uh, doing a memory task. So we've, got, we've mentioned this project on uh, mouse models of dementia that we're trying to characterize things, things there. And for that I'm now going to jump back a bit. Um, now I've got 11 minutes, okay, so I've got time to go through this next section. I'm going to jump back a bit to calcium imaging. So um, so whole cell patch kind of recording, great for looking at single cells. I, we are working actually on expanding it to um, multiple cells. So people doing the blind uh, robotic patching, I've, I've got that going, and quad patching, etc. So um, I've got a student working um, on expanding that um, uh, with two photo targeted patching to multiple cells, which I think will will add a lot of you know, to the potential questions we can use it to ask. Um, but, you know, it's one side of the story, and the other side is, um, I think, looking at calcium imaging and, of course, also voltage sensing is very important as well. So we've worked a bit on imaging analysis tools for the calcium imaging um, data. I'm just going to sort of select one here, um, which is um, uh, region of interest uh, segmentation. Um, uh, 
uh, there's an uh, algorithm called ABLE that we developed, activity-based level set segmentation for basically pulling out regions of interest corresponding to individual cell bodies. Um, now, you might think this is a relatively simple problem. You just do a correlation map and draw a boundary and it'll work okay and you can get, get something. It, I, I would argue it's not, um, and you'll see a, 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 see a slide in uh, two slides time which will actually sort of show you um, what, you know, why that really is the case. It does matter uh, what algorithm you actually use in terms of the cells you pick up. Some cells you'll pick up with anything, but, but not all. So basically, um, this is a collaboration with Pierluigi Dragotti in the electrical engineering department, and basically it's um, um, evolving, a, basically you've got an active contour for each region, so there's you know, one, one of these regions for every cell, effectively, you sort of select how many there'll be, um, and each of them are actively in, evolving, um, um, under the control of a, a differential equation there to basically maximize a, a cost function. It still uses the correlation information. Um, it doesn't require the cells to have, say, classical calcium transient type correlation coefficients, as we'll see in a sec. Um, and basically, um, the level set function, it's basically you've got a higher dimensional function based on this cost function whose zero crossing is the cell boundary. So you've got basically this sort of evolving to maximize this constraint for each of these cells. Um, and um, it, works, it works quite well. So here's, here's an example um, uh, taken from uh, calcium imaging data. Um, this is some um, AM loading data from SLICE recorded in, uh, in my lab, I think, or... No, actually, sorry, no, sorry, this one is actually from the Svoboda data set, uh, uh, publicly available Svoboda data set. Um, and um, <coughs> so it's, in this case, AM loading data. We've also got it working nicely with GCAM6 data. Um, so you can see some of the example regions it's sort of pulling out here. And one of the nice things about it is it's not, you know, you don't just get um, regions with this sort of classical calcium transients here, but you, you get others, others which... Um, when we look at them further, we're convinced actually uh, you know, you know, correspond to you know, things like higher firing rate neurons, etc., that, uh, that are giving, um, giving correlations that are based upon the activity, but they're not corresponding to these sort of classical sparse, uh, sparse things. And of course, you also get glial cells and things as well. It works quite nicely with neuropil contamination re removal algorithms, which are very important uh, to do. You can see an example here that if you, um, if you look at the the region corresponding to the cell and the sort of the surrounding area, um, you've got some contamination there that you should remove to get the sort of cleaner, um, a cleaner signal. Um, so how does it compare to other approaches? Um, so we compared it to um, Sweet2P and um, CNMF um, uh, algorithms. And actually the interesting thing of this whole picture is that while there are many cells, like the one in, ones in black that are found by all algorithms, um, Actually, there are many cells that are found only by one of the algorithms. So each of those individual colors there, yellow, magenta, and um, blue there, found only by one of the algorithms. And it's sort of labeled across here, and some found by, by just a couple of them. I mean, the algorithms you know, roughly do um, similar. There is, you know, there's no real ground truth for this. So we're comparing this with, with the manual labeling from the um, NeuroFinder Challenge data set. So, that's not ground truth. It's really important to emphasize that. It's just somebody, you know. Um, and both this person and the three algorithms find a highly... Well, there are many cells in each of them that they find, find that the others don't, and, um, and converse. Um, so Sweet2P, for instance, um, is getting um, slightly higher percentage of the manual regions found in um, those estimates, but um, also has issues with fallout, there's a certain number of its estimates not found in the ground truth, so it's effectively sort of false positives, it's just finding more regions um, than the other algorithms. Um, okay, so um, so that sort of works quite nicely, that's one of the things we've uh, in integrated into a, um, a pipeline um, that we've developed. Um, we're now applying this um, to um, um, mice performing a, a, a memory task, um, here's is just an example. This is this. Uh, this is a Neurotar uh, platform. It's basically a um, um, a floating. If you can see here, there's this bed here. There's a lot of holes in there. It's um, uh, air attached attached here. And you've got this sort of um, sort of hockey puck type thing. It's actually the 
the um, chamber itself, which is floating. So the animal's head fixed. It can move around and explore the chamber. Um, and you can sort of see that there. Here's another. And sort of doing that, um, you can get similar trajectories found um, in head fixed mice to freely uh, moving mice. So here's, um, well, this is not truly freely moving. This was tethered. This is some data from David Dupre. Um, and this is our, um, our head fixed version um, with similar um, sort of speed um, histograms. Um, we can implement sort of various environments with this. This, this one here is a, um, um, a sort of circular version of a linear track. The animal can come, come up sort of one end and then sort of move back around. Um, and we then track the movement, which is on the slide that's coming with a circular linear. So this, this, this version is the one where the animal just can go round and round and round. Um, this version is the one where the animal can go round and back, etc. And we can do sort of Y mazes and things as well. So we're now working on mapping place fields in this um, um, in this environment. Um, so we're doing this with sort of labeling um, cells in hippocampus, hippocampus CA1 with uh, GCAMP 6M Ruby. Um, um, it's been developed by Tobias Rose. Um, it's working quite nicely for us. Um, the nice thing about this, we use the red channel and we're actually seeding um, the ABLE algorithm um, not just with so you can you can see it with basically a correlation map effectively, you know some putative likely um, uh, you know likely neurons. What we're doing is we're seeding it with the red channel here, so it's sort of labeling cell bodies, so we can make it sort of at least more immune to the problem of selecting only the active cells because we want basically to see all of the cells, even if the cell is sort of firing you know one spike every two minutes or something or other, we might not otherwise pick it up, but uh, we might have more of a chance if we're actually seeding our region with. Uh, with the red channel here. Um, we're doing this um, together with um, um, methoxio 4 labeling of amyloid plaques. So we do an IP injection um, um, of methoxio 4 We then label that down at 720 nanometers, take a reference image, and we can then move, through, move back up to um, um, 940 to do our uh, um, imaging, and then that's sort of an overlay, an overlay there. Um, we're able to image over multiple days. This is one of the nice things. You can go back to the same cells over multiple days, and you can see, so here's a, here's a few traces there. We're seeing sort of images um, um, of the same region over multiple days we're revisiting. We can revisit the same cells, um, look at you know, how their calcium transients change, etc. cetera, um, over there. Now, I just sort of added this as a point for discussion later about the, um, and actually, um, bringing up the point made before earlier about uh, the NWB format. We've started adopting the NWB format as well. So far, just for the time series, so we've decided it was too hard initially just to put all the imaging data in from scratch, and maybe that's the long-term goal, is that at each stage of develop, at each stage of acquisition, you know, we'd have that available in a standardized format. So far, what we're doing is we've just got those in TIF stacks, and then as soon as we've got the time series data, that's going into NWB format. We're getting all the tools working with that first, and then we'll move back. Um, um, so, we're, so we so um, we had an opportunity with setting up this new analysis pipeline to, in a sense, sort of re-standardize our format. So we're sort of moving, you know, going with the NWB. Um, we develop, we've been developing this sort of in-house analysis pipeline, pipeline NeuroC, um, um, which um, um, hopefully will be ready to publish uh, um, well, early next year. Um, which incorporates basically these sort of different tools. It, it brings together sort of some, some movement correction um, with um, the ABLE uh, algorithm, with some of the calcium transient detection algorithms that we've developed, etc. Um, uh, together. Um, okay, and that, and that is based around the NWB platform. Then at the, at the end of the experiment series, um, basically we take the animal, we we kill it, um, and do whole brain two photon tomography. Um, so. Uh, this is with a tissue site um, 1000 system. So basically, it's again a two photon microscope, but it takes a 100 micron stack, slices it off, the next 100 micron stack, etc. So we can then rebuild um, a 3D image of the whole, the, brain, the whole brain of the mouse that we've previously done our in vivo experiments in. So the example you'll see just in a second is a 5X FAD mouse. That's a mouse model of uh, early onset Alzheimer's disease uh, labeled with methoxy 4 So what we're looking at is largely the methoxy 4 label at the moment, and there's a gray um, autofluorescent channel as well. Um, so this is sort of, again, it's one of the animals that we didn't, uh, didn't experiment on, but uh, um, we can just get, uh, this is a fairly far gone Alzheimer's mouse, let's just say there's uh, amyloid plaques all over the place. Um, 
one of the things I think it's important to work on now with this is actually um, label-free imaging methods for trying to relate different types of information. For instance, label-free, um, it would be fantastic to have a, a label-free NISL, um, um, NISL imaging method, um, which is something that we're, we're sort of thinking about deeply. So I think that gives you a sort of a, f a feeling of the sort of the, the pipeline of data collection and processing that sort of we're working on through the lab at the moment. So I've got minus 10 seconds left, so I'll finish with uh, acknowledging basically the various people involved in the work. Um, so that the patching robot work um, was um, mostly done by Luca and Aquino with a, a, a bunch of collaborators as well, uh, Paul Chatterton, uh, uh, another PI at uh, Imperial, uh, now just moving to Bristol, um, is a, an in vivo patching expert, provided a lot of uh, the patching advice. Um, a lot of the data analysis uh, tool development work is done in collaboration with a signal processing expert, Pierluigi Dragotti, um, with a joint student, uh, um, Steph Reynolds. Um, the um, in vivo imaging work is led by a postdoc in my lab, Marianne Go, with a, a, a bunch of other collaborators as well. And I also have to thank uh, Troy Magri and Molly Strong at the Century Welcome Center, who saved our bacon on that neuron paper with uh, transgenic my, uh, mice that uh, we needed at the last minute to do some um, uh, more experiments for reviewers. So, uh, and finally, to sort of thank our funders, um, particularly the Michael Uren Foundation, and uh, um, you for your attention. So, thank you. Simon, so that was very interesting. So, as you know, our basically our entire understanding of spike to calcium transformation yep. is built on a handful of cells. Yep. Uh, I mean, like five handful of cells. Yep, yep, sure. And it seems like this method would be ideal to extend that, right? These you're talking about the, the robotic patching to get ground truth on that, is what you're saying? Yeah. Uh, to Sorry. sort of switch instead of using yeah. um, the two-faulted imaging yeah. for passive morphology yeah. to yeah. use it for sort of active GCAMP or so on and then yeah, just yeah, yeah. collect a heck of a lot of ground yeah. truth data to understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. <laughs> Does that, but, but I noticed that both your and yeah. Boyden's yeah. paper actually yeah. don't, don't do that. And I was wondering, is there some fundamental difficulty of doing that or is it just that uh, it just wasn't the first thing. I mean, we can, so with the, with the GCAM6, for instance. Um, yep, exactly. So one of the things with the GCAM6, of course, is that um, the baseline fluorescence is reasonably low. So, of course, you can see the cells when they're, um, when they're fluorescing, um, unless you have something else in it as well. I think in terms of using it for targeting, with our method, with the computer vision system, you kind of want to have a stable, um, a stable visual signature, if you like. So if it's changing because of activity level things, it might kind of get in the way. I agree, but I think you could yeah. signal process that away, right? I mean, yeah, I from mean, something silly like a max projection to something yeah, smarter. No, like. Absolutely, yeah. And also, I mean, of course, you can use in combination with other labels as well, like the MRuby one. Then, you know, to use that for targeting and then use the GCAM6 to study what's going on functionally. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think, you know, patching with simultaneous calcium is, you can probably tell us a lot. Yeah, that's a hugely valuable data set that, you know, half of the world is using GCAMP, yet there are 30 neurons that are supposed to inform our entire understanding of how spikes relate yeah, to GCAMP. Sure. Absolutely, yes, we... Yeah. Yep. Yep. Just to follow that up, yeah. so uh, I completely agree with this uh, comment, uh, the previous comment, so I would just say that the patch pipette yeah. Yeah. may not be the best for yeah. getting that ground truth because it's because fairly it's, large, yeah. right? So it's actually, I mean, that's why when you're going there with the patch prepared with yeah. a positive pressure, right, it's yeah. going to be spew, I mean, you know, it's going to push the tissue, right? So if I were to yeah. do it uh, specifically for yeah. that purpose, I would use, a, uh, for example, a Juxa cell or pipette, which sure. is much smaller. Yeah, yeah, so sure. that could be yeah. possible, right, without yeah. difficulty, right? Yeah, exactly. You could One of the things that we've... Um, thought about doing proposed sort of various uh, um, projects which didn't get funded, uh, etc., uh, was to basically incorporate Juxta uh, with this, in fact. Um, so I spent some time recently at the, the MRC Brain Network Dynamics Unit in Oxford. Uh, obviously, a lot of people there who are experts in that technique, and uh, it's certainly something that we could incorporate. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I wondered how quickly the uh, Z correction works as you come down, and is that limiting how quickly you can get the pipette down to the cell? And as an add-on to that, what do you need in addition to a uh, two-photon microscope and a basic patch uh, equipment in order to implement it? Um, so second question first, not really anything. I mean, there's uh, a few little 
cheap devices, um, you know, electro pneumatic pressure controller, etc. But you know, nothing substantial. Um, uh, and with the first one, I, that's not really the limiting factor in a sense. Um, I mean, yeah. So it takes. So the typical time to obtain a seal is six minutes. And yes, you could probably cut it, but I don't think you know in the context of your of your overall throughput, I don't think that's actually going, you know going to be. It's not going to be here or there. Or there uh, really. one, just yeah. one additional yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, and what about the Dura? What do you do about that? Um, we, yeah. What we've, we we were reflecting a bit of Jura. We're not going through Jura okay. for those experiments. Okay. Yeah. Uh, question on the, the rate limiting step yeah. for the multi patch. Yeah. Um, are, it, do you find that it is almost a, just a direct probability multiplication? So for, for the multi success? multi patch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know yet because the student is basically just yeah, um, just getting going. But um, the um, Yeah, I mean, we've got, I guess we've got plans, as to, we've got a couple of plans as to, as to how to do it. I mean, there's sort of an, an iterative version versus, uh, um, v versus, yeah, compensating for the, the um, uh, resultant vector, if you like. Um, and I guess we're going to just plug it and see which works best. Um, obviously, if we can just do the resultant, it should be quicker, whether or not that time matters in the context. You know, you're doing a multi-patch experiment, you're probably going to get one experiment per, per animal, right? So you're not, you know, you'll be very happy with that. So, I, again, I, th I think it's probably the time save uh, may not be the most important issue. The most important issue is actually how well it works. Yeah. Okay, so why don't you go ahead with the question and maybe everyone has all the speakers, Yota, Sanaka, do you come, come up with any time? Go ahead, yes. Do you see the patch robot um, getting out of the few labs that have built them and becoming more well, like, you know, being, you, will like every lab who does patch clamp currently get a patch robot? And what's what's limiting that? <laughs> and uh, yeah. is, 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 is there sort of a niche for in vivo patch clamp robots that's, that makes, it makes a lot of sense to have an in vivo patch clamp robot, but that, yeah. you know, but still for high quality in vitro recordings, yeah. you, a robot probably might not be sufficient. Sure. The, I mean, the... I mean, two photo microscopes. I guess so. For a start, you've got to have a two photo microscope. So it's kind of you know become as a sort of dissemination limiting step. That's still an issue. Obviously, it'll become less an issue over time when as laser sources are, are getting better. Um, we, um, I mean, basically we um, ha had plans to sort of try and uh, commercialize it. Uh, we're kind of uh, in no man's land on that. So we'll see if that goes anywhere. We've made it publicly available. I think to actually do something. I mean, it's all very well making it publicly available, but you kind of have to have the resources to make it easy for people to use. So what we'd thought of is we could set something up with a sort of model where we basically send someone to your lab for, you know, for three weeks to show you how to do things with it and set it, set it all up. I think that's what you would probably need to really disseminate that. So you need to have a sort of a cost model which deals with that. So I think a pure open source thing won't really help because it will get it into a few more labs, but not many. So you know, I guess we'll have to see where we, where we can go with that. <laughs> 